patients in Pandora voice. Uh, but on the other hand, for me, I wanted more to write about traditional Hmong customs as I'd seen them and as they'd been recorded in Thailand and Laos and Vietnam, so that the young people wouldn't forget about them, and also so that others would come to appreciate some of the richness and complexities of Hmong traditional culture. So Gary kept saying to me how I was stuck in the past. Nobody cared if there were lots of first cousin marriages recorded in Laos and in, 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 uh, statistics in the 1960s, or how people go around the, the uh, tree at the New Year ritual, uh, or whether shamans believe in different kinds of plea or soul. And we had lots of discussions, some arguments about this sort of thing. In the process, I've come to realize, I'm afraid, how much of Hmong culture has already been lost and is still now being lost. But at the same time, <clears throat> I also realized how Gary was right, how we can't keep on clinging blindly to the past. Society and culture change and move on, and it can still remain wrong. For instance, in the film uh, Gran Torino, I was amused to see uh, Sue telling the old guy, Walt, that in Hmong culture you never touch people on the head. Because to me, that's Thai culture, or Lao culture. After living in Thailand for two years, where you have to be really careful not to throw your feet around or pat someone's head, I did it once with a boy student who went off to cry in a corner and said I'd broken his head. It was a huge relief to be able to live with a mom who just didn't care about these things and would not even lower their heads when a Thai king came to visit. But then I realized that maybe the film was right about the Hmong in the U.S. today. And the Hmong in the U.S. may have picked up quite a few Lao or Thai customs and habits, particularly in food, as part of a general feeling of wanting to be known or identified as Southeast Asians in the American population. So that this is part of being Hmong now, nowadays. Now, I'm not sure of the answer to that particular question, but it has taught me not to stick too, uh, too rigidly, too closely to the past. Not to think that we know what Hmong culture is just because we saw some parts of it in Thailand in 1981. Um, and, and a few other little issues which Hmong researchers have had may interest you also and shed some light on this. There's really a question of how much one should be faithful to the present day Hmong view of things when so much has changed. For example, Jacques Lemoyne, once identified the Hmong god, the Hmong deity of uh, Niu Va Kuo Teng as a hybrid figure which derives partly from the Indian god of death, Yama, and partly from the Chinese deity, the Jade Emperor, or Yu Huang. I wanted to put this in our textbook. But Gary said, who ever knows about that sort of thing? For the Hmong today, Niu Ba Kuo Teng is just a Hmong god, a Hmong deity like a shop or a new. And there's no point in adding some obscure historical interpretation which anyway may not be right, in Gary's opinion. Whereas I felt it might be important to show that the Hmong have always been open to other cultural traditions in the course of their long history, and accepted other cultural influences too, particularly the influences of the great Indian and Chinese civilizations which have gone to form most of Southeast Asia today, an open, accepting society. Um, but maybe it's really irrelevant to how modern they think about new to a thing. Another example is uh, Shanglongwe, or sighting remains of the mountains, or a grave site, or a house or a village where it's first set up. Now, in the past, I've often translated this as sighting remains of the dragon, because long in Chinese means dragon. And all through Yunnan province, where the Hmong use a lot of the local Yunnan dialects, and for Yunnanese traders in Laos and Thailand, who used to have close contacts with the Hmong, Hmong may meet geomancy, or the veins of the dragon, in the landscape. But Gary pointed out to me that Hmong, after all, doesn't mean dragon in Hmong. That's Xia, which of course I knew very well. And the dragons are basically frightening and scary creatures for many or most long. Although I think that may come from the Lao idea of Nyak, or Ogre. Well, it doesn't really matter what we put in the book in the end. 
What matters is that we had to talk about these things. The point is that there's a real question here. Lungli certainly uh, really or originally means the veins of the dragon as I see it. But instead of saying Lungli, the Long can also say more simply just Mekto, or, or literally the veins of the hills. So while dragon is correct as I see it, it may not correspond well to present day understandings of the Long who don't know Chinese. A final example was a discussion between me and Jacques Lemoyne, which took place some years ago, or rather an argument. And this time, I was more on the Hmong Hmong side, or what would become Gary's side, than on the outside researcher's side. And I felt we shouldn't go beyond ordinary Hmong understandings into some secret or esoteric knowledge, which maybe only came from one shaman. When the shaman chants in uh, Wenen, he invites, along with a lot of other spirits and gods and natural forces, the spirit of the Leng God which I thought, like Morishan and Motin, must be parrot. But the one pointed out it's not parrot. A parrot or parakeet should be lengo with a tone shape. That's a high high tone. L-E-B, not L-E-J, in case I'm not saying it right. He made the same mistake as me originally, and his teacher or master shaman, Sihu Shong Chuya, had corrected him. According to the one, what Lang Lang Ka is to perform shamanism Ki Leo Si Bien, or Tom Just, the spirit which is correct, which succeeds, which hits the nail on the head. And this important spirit, summoned by the shaman, is the clairvoyant spirit, or the spirit or spirits of clairvoyance, which comes from the Chinese Ling Kia, subtle or ingenious. However, I felt that many more might understand that as parrot, and so we should perhaps stick to the normal understanding of all this as parrot. So these kind of differences of opinion and emphasis between people who try to understand Hmong culture may also show how much Hmong culture and society are always developing and changing. And sometimes it's difficult for researchers to know how to keep up, or how close to Hmong understandings we should try to be. So, I've learned valuable lessons from Gary over the past few years, and I'd like to thank him and all Hmong for those lessons which I continue to learn as Hmong culture itself changes and the society moves on in so many new and different, but still Hmong ways. Thank you. Good job.